Well, this evening we're turning to uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13. So again, good to see all of you along as we come to God's Word uh, this evening. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and uh, we're going from one extreme to another this evening. It was one verse last week, and I'm going to try and finish the whole passage uh, this evening. Uh, There's no rhyme or reason, and uh, if you try to look for any sort of pattern within my uh, studies, you're not going to find them. It's just how, how the Lord leads and uh, what I, f- I believe is best uh, for the message. Uh, but f- 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and uh, while it turns to that passage, just to remind you of a couple of things. Do you pray for the open air tomorrow? It uh, looks like we have the dry weather at least, and uh, so keep uh, the, those that do the open air in prayer uh, for the preaching of the gospel and the, the giving out of the tracts and the bookstall and so forth. And do pray also for uh, this coming Lord's Day and the meetings. I mentioned by uh, WhatsApp and text to those that received those messages that I was um, contacted by Mark McGaw, who really looks after the Let the Bible Speak recordings, and uh, just the, the way things have really fallen, that they're moving into their new premises. There's a whole new building going up, of course, in the autumn time, which means they've had to try to push a few later recordings into the next number of weeks and couple of months. And uh, that's why uh, it was only short notice. We normally get a bit more notice than just one month. Um, so I, I put that interest out amongst you. If anyone was free to join with me uh, on April the 11th, it's a Thursday evening. Uh, I know that you hear me enough, and uh, hearing me again is probably uh, not always the best thing. But if you think of it more in terms of supporting the Let the Bible Speak ministry, and uh, it's a very important one that we have in our denomination. So a a few of you have got in touch and uh, said that it is possible. I know some of you can't. I appreciate uh, the response of those who have got in touch. So uh, with with a handful of people, uh, I think we'll just go forward in faith and I'll keep pushing it and keep pitching and keep bending your ears and uh, hopefully we'll have a few more uh, that will join us maybe from other places as well. So just keep that in your mind if you didn't get that message. April the 11th, it's a Thursday and uh, we'll go ahead and take the minibus down or something along those lines. We'll head down to Logan and have one of those uh, TV recordings, which, by the way, I dread. Far, far more easier to, to preach in front of um, yourselves uh, without cameras being pointing in your face and uh, lights and so on showing up all of your blemishes. Um, but we know it's a ministry and God has used it uh, over the years. We do have a deputation, by the way, that Wednesday beforehand of Let the Bible Speak. So it sort of fits in well. Uh, so maybe on that Wednesday, you'll start feeling a bit guilty uh, hearing deputation and put your name down uh, for the last minute. Anyway, that's just me to push home uh, one more attempt to get you along. Um, so that, that's something to keep in prayer. Uh, the, the Seniors Fellowship will be on Tuesday the 12th, so bear that in mind as well next Tuesday. And the list for prayer, we'll go through a few names before the prayer time. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and uh, this evening with the Lord's help, and I need much help this evening, I'm saying to Stephen and Roy, it's a difficult passage, uh, and I'm not afraid to admit that, I'm not afraid to uh, really sort of say it from the beginning, that's my excuse, and uh, I I hope that you don't go home confused, I hope you go home enlightened and uh, encouraged around the word, but I have to get out there and say it's not an easy passage uh, by any means, So probably of all the studies so far, Uh, the one I found uh, the most taxing. So uh, we'll see how it goes. And I'll read from verse 8 through to the end of the chapter, and then we'll get to our Bible study uh, this evening. So 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verse 8. I want us to think about the greatest Christian love, the greatest of all gifts. So Paul continues, and he says in verse 8, Charity or love, as we know that word means, never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. And whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass, you'll have a margin, it will say mirror. For now we see through a mirror or a glass, darkly or in a riddle. But then face to face, 
Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three. But the greatest of these is charity. We'll finish there at verse 13. And with that last text, I really use as the uh, text for my message, love. We've been looking at Christian love in this chapter. And this evening we bring it to a close before we move into chapter 14. And our message is... Uh, Christian love, the greatest of all gifts. Now, most of us have heard of or have read possibly multiple times Lewis Carroll's 1865 classic Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. For, for those of us that uh, are parents or have been parents or know anything about World Book Day when it comes to school, you'll know there are two dreads uh, that come into the parents' heart. First of all, the announcement that it is World Book Day uh, because you have to try to make an out- outfit for your child. And when you've got four of the things running around the house and uh, you're running out of ideas of books, you just start throwing bin liners over them and hoping for the best when it comes to stories. Uh, the other dread is uh, sending off uh, your, your daughter, sometimes your son, as Alice in Wonderland and uh, fearing that every other child has gone as the same uh, because it's one of those, those typical characters It's World Book Day tomorrow, by the way, so it all fits in sort of nicely with my introduction. Uh, We've all read the book and we've heard of of, uh, Lewis Carroll's classic, because in in the very opening chapter, uh, Alice follows a white rabbit with pink eyes. Uh, She's uh, curious as to the rabbit. I think the rabbit has a, a pocket watch or something along those lines. And she chases the rabbit down a hole, and as she goes down the hole, she falls down the hole, And as we know, the story then unfolds. She falls into the wonderland. And the rest, we can say, is history. The opening title is just simply referred to as named as Down the Rabbit Hole. And uh, it's that idiom, it's that phrase, it's that expression which is passed into our vocabulary to this very day. So whenever we're referring to a time of distraction or we're referring to losing track of time or losing our way or losing the subject, we might say, or even going off on a tangent, well, we might say that person's gone down uh, the, the rabbit hole. Um, I, 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 I always enjoy hearing the preaching of Dr. Kearns, the, the late Dr. Kearns, of course, one of the men I, I enormously respect as a minister of the Word of God and have listened to, to many of his sermons. I always smile during his messages because he, he tends to really uh, introduce his sermons And I'm sure if he was with us here today, he would say the same uh, by saying he's about to go down the tangent. He he intends to go down uh, these tangents. And uh, it's always a a comical thing to hear it. But of course, you're always blessed when he does because they're they're tremendous messages. I've looked at these these verses this evening, verses 8 to 13, and there's the very real possibility that we can lose sight of the main theme lose sight of the main message by allowing ourselves to go down what we might say a rabbit hole or down a different direction, down a tangent or something along those lines. And that's really because of the presence of verses uh, 9 to 12. It, It doesn't mean, by the way, but let me just make this very clear, that verses 9 to 12 are irrelevant. Of course they're not irrelevant. It's Holy Scripture. And this is this is God's holy word and we have to deal with it as carefully and as best as we possibly can, but we should not be so taken up by trying to work out verses 9 through to 12, especially the words of verse 10, that we then forget what Paul was teaching all along. And and possibly when it comes to Christians and churches and pastors and ministers and studying the Word of God, that's one of the mistakes that we, we can all make, whether it's a preacher or whether we're just seeking ourselves as Christians as we read the Word of God, we must always keep ourselves firmly on a solid footing, and the solid footing is always seeking to work out what is the primary application, what's the primary teaching within any given chapter and within any given verse. What is Paul teaching in chapter 13? Look, we know he's teaching about the, the preeminence of Christian love. That goes without saying. That has to be in mind at every turn at every stage. We can't, you know, drift away from that line of thinking. And so when we look at the likes of verse 8, charity never faileth, and we're going to deal with that very soon. 
And you look at verse 13. Now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three. The greatest of these is charity. There are the anchor points. That's what we you know, really fix our thoughts upon. And, and, and it's when you do that, we will have a better, I believe certainly, a better understanding of the middle verses, verses 9 through to 12. Uh, remember, as we look at these portions of Scripture here this evening, that in Corinth, in Corinth, there were many that were elevating the supernatural gifts. Okay, so that's something else we've been dealing with in these studies. And do you remember how uh, the, the gift of speaking tongues, remember the gift of speaking tongues, as we read of it here and shall do in chapter 14, is not the same thing that is uh, people trying to pass for tongues in our present day. Uh, Paul deals, as the scripture does, with a, you know, a, a language, a phonetic language, you might say. You know, these are actual words, actual syllables, actual vocabulary. It was the supernatural gift to speak a, an earthly language that had never been learned before. That's what we're dealing with when we say the gift of tongues. That's what the people of Corinth had, or many of them had. That's what uh, the apostles had. And, and Paul is uh, dealing with a, an area of strife within the church where this gift, along with many of the other gifts, they had been elevated. And in elevating these things, they had diminished and they had really lowered and belittled the very thing that must be regarded as the greatest Christian love. And I want that to just sink into our hearts this evening and just let that keep you as we work our way through these words. Because again, that's what he's going to emphasize and seek to explain this evening. You can't be doing this because the greatest of all the gifts is this agape charity or Christian love. And that's why we can quite rightly refer to it uh, by way really of concluding our studies in chapter 13 as the greatest of all gifts. And I, and I certainly hope and pray you may not have followed everything of his last number of five or six studies in this chapter, but I, I certainly pray that you've got the thrust of it and that you'll just go away knowing this is the one thing that we must pray for each and every day of our life. Lord, increase that love towards God and towards God's people within my soul. So Christian love, that the greatest of all gifts. Why is it the greatest of all gifts? Well, that's what we want to look at this evening with the remainder of our time. And I want to do it under two headings or two explanations. Firstly, because of its enduring presence. It is the greatest of all, Christian, because of its enduring presence. Look at verse 8. This is our first anchor this evening. Charity never faileth. So whatever else we make of these next few verses, and we're going to go on a bit of a journey here, so I'm going to ask you to get on the train and stay with me and uh, keep looking at the scenery and making sure that you're with me all the way. But let's just keep going back to what is our destination. Charity never fails. That, that's the, the point he establishes here. Look, notice it's an emphatic statement. It really is. This, this love, this charity, which is rooted in God, which reflects the nature of God, which is given by the Holy Spirit of God, which, remember, uniquely true of the Christian. This is not just general love of any person. This is the Spirit-given love. It never fails. And, and so immediately we're going to ask the question here, what does this mean, it never fails? Well, we know that the English word fail has, has different meanings. Hands in the air if you failed an exam. You don't have to put your hand in the air, by the way. Hand in your, in your, in your mind, you could say. Paul, your hand was in the air there. How many exam exams? <laughs> or you were itching there, something along those lines. I, I've, I failed a few exams. By the way, I got a D in food technology and went on to be a chef. So, <laughs> but then, but then uh, you know, I'm not sure how I did well as being a chef. So that, was, uh, that, that wasn't in my notes, by the way. Uh, that, was, that was the gift of distraction and going down the tangent. Uh, so we, we can fail tests and exams. We, we don't get the required mark. We don't get the past mark. We can fail each other. Okay, so we can, we can fail to meet each other's standard. We can be a disappointment to individuals. That's not the meaning here. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about duration and time. In other words, 
what he's saying in verse 8 is that this love, this charity, it never falls away. It never fades away. It never goes into non-existence. It's always going to be there. It's always going to last. It's always going to endure. That's what it means by charity never fed. If the same word is in 1 Peter 1, 24, uh, translated this way, the flower thereof falleth away. You know, the grass fades, the flower falls away. It all goes away in time. But, but not this, not this Christian love, not this charity. It doesn't do this. And this is why Paul is spending a great deal of time developing Christian charity and love because we're not dealing with a grace or a virtue limited to one stage or one time in the Christian church or the Christian history. Listen, it doesn't matter that we're dealing with Corinth or Ephesus or Philippi or we're dealing with 1st century, 3rd century, 10th century, whatever we're dealing with here, we're dealing with truth that remains the same across all ages. This doesn't change. This is the reflection of God himself in the life of the believer, and it has to be there. It doesn't fade with time. It has to be there at all times. In Corinth, their behavior was not reflecting this. It was not reflecting this. And you know what? We can be just the same. And every church can be guilty of the same. To make this even clearer, the enduring nature of charity and Christian love is contrasted with spiritual gifts. Now that's where we come to the rabbit hole and we have to be a little bit careful in our thoughts and our considerations. And to make this as strong as possible, the, the Lord directs Paul to now use a contrast in verse 8. So he says, charity never faileth, but, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Same word. Okay, so something's f fading away, going away into non-existence. Well, prophecies. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. That's actually a lot more emphatic. It's stopping, it ends. And uh, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And we go to verse 9 and verse 10. Most of the questions around this passage and the, the scratching on the head by, by preachers and, and everyone alike tends to gravitate around verse 10. What does it even mean? What does it mean? Let's read the words again together. We want to be as careful and as, as, as methodical as we can. Verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. The question is, what is meant by that which is perfect? Now, there are several views. Okay, There are several views. There are a number of views. More than, more than three, four or five, possibly even more, we might say. And, and they're all sort of slightly nuanced and different. Some are, uh, are quite different. This really opens up another subject altogether. And it's one that I want to just really touch upon very briefly. And I want to give thought to it uh, you know, very carefully as much as we can this evening. Because it's one that focuses upon the supernatural gifts of the apostles and the early church and whether or not those same gifts, okay, these supernatural gifts, the speaking a language they'd never learned before, the gift of healing and so on and so forth, are they still in the church today? Are they still with us today or, or did they stop and cease at some point in history? So that, that's the, the, the debate that sort of rages around these particular verses. They come under the headings of what some of you may have come across and I won't take for granted we've all have heard these titles I think many of you have so I'll I'll, I'll mention them uh, they come under the headings the cessationist view uh, and then they come under the heading of the continuationist view so believers will generally put themselves into one of two categories uh, I'm a cessationist and again that's my own view and my own conviction and in that view we are saying along the lines that the supernatural gifts all ceased with or very soon after the days of the apostles. That's the basic and the sort of, we might say, the, the bare bone definition of someone who is a cessationist. Again, I want to make very clear, even within that camp, there are little differences here and there. Uh, too many to, to list and name this evening, we'll get confused. But that's the, that's the bare definition. Someone who is a cessationist is saying, these supernatural gifts as distinct from, we might say, the more permanent gifts to pastor and teach and be a help and so on. They, they, these are gifts that will remain in the church, the supernatural ones. 
That's, that's stopped. Does it mean God cannot act in a miraculous way? No, we're not saying that. God can choose to heal if he so wishes. God can do the, uh, the miraculous. We, we do not limit God. But we're saying that this, this, this role, this, this, uh, this ability that was given to apostles and believers in the early church, this supernatural gift, that has ceased. And so that's where the word cessationist uh, comes from. Others will take a different view, and uh, we, we tend to always associate the, the word continuationist to extreme charismatics. Okay? So we say those that are continuationists who say these gifts haven't finished, that's the charismatic camp. Well, a bit of a newsflash, many of them, many of them are, but even within that camp, there are those that we might say would be evangelical, reformed, and they would still hold a view. They would still say, nope. I don't think you can demonstrate from Scripture uh, these gifts have come to uh, a cessation. They will say that what we're seeing today has nothing to do with New Testament gifts, and they'll make that abundantly clear. But I want to be broad and as fair and as generous as I can uh, this evening. What we need to do this evening is something very careful. We need to keep our focus, okay? Because, like I said, it can become a bit, a bit of a, a rabbit hole. Uh, for example, it should be pointed out that Many who are in that first camp, cessationists, that is, the supernatural gifts have all come to a, a close, they've finished. They will go then further and they'll come into verse 10, and it's, it's held by many within our own ranks, we would say, and they'll say, it happened at the completion of Holy Scripture. So when that which is perfect is come, and they say that perfect refers to the completion of the Holy Word of God. That's, that's held by, by many good sound uh, people. Uh, uh, others actually would not hold that. They would be cessationists and they say, no, verse 10 refers to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And some say, well, no, it's actually just a time of, of glory when a, when, a, when, a, when a saint passes on and or even just the eternal state altogether. You, you start to see, I came across one view and I, and I have a lot of sympathy with it. And, and they will say, well, actually, the, the word perfect in verse 10 gives us the idea of, of maturity as opposed to something which is in part. And the point being is that when there is a maturity which is reached in the Christian life, and certainly in terms of the Christian church in its early days, in its infancy, it was, Paul was urging them, you're to go on to maturity. These, these gifts that you have, they're just for a time. You're making them as, as if they're, they're always going to be around. They're not. They're going to pass away. And, and they did pass away. There's clear evidence with the New Testament scriptures they weren't referred to after Corinthians. They had passed away. You're, you're, you're now in a place of maturity. You don't need these things. It's like a child on a, on a, on a, on a bike that has stabilizers. And, and, and when that perfect mature stage comes, you don't need those stabilizers. You can go yourself. And that's what Paul, I believe, probably is really saying here. Whether it ties into the completion of Holy Scripture or not, I don't know if we can really hinge all that upon verse 10. But certainly I, I'm convinced that this place of maturity has been arrived at many, many years ago in these early stages of, of the church history. There is, Paul is saying, ultimately, there's no need. There's no need for these sign gifts. They, they pass on. They're in part. They're imperfect. They were for a time. And, and the, 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 what we have need of now is that which goes on forever and endures, namely, Christian love. That's as simple as I can try to make that rationale and that thinking. It's important, therefore, that we do things by way of application when you come to passages like this. Christian, keep the focus on what is the main teaching here. The main teaching is emphasizing the need of Christian love within the church of Jesus Christ. We should not, we do not need to make verse 10, by the way, a hinge upon which we say the sign of gifts are no more. I believe many other scriptures indicate that. I do believe there's a danger, and it can happen to all of us, the best of us, that when we overreact to the presence of maybe error, such as what you see in extreme charismatic movements, that we go to the other extreme, and then we try to read into texts what our views are, and we can get a little bit clumsy in the process. We've got to do what, the, you know, what our confession teaches us, and what the, really what uh, reform teaching is, 
is that the scripture itself will always be its own interpreter. And we, we come to these words, we say, well, Lord, what are you teaching here? And, and, and he's saying, charity never fails. These supernatural gifts fail. I mean, it's clear as day. They, they, they fail, they, they pass away, they cease, they vanish. I'm, I'm not going to spend all my time worrying about the precise year and time and when that happened, but clearly they're not in existence. But what is Christian love? And we don't want to act in any other way than what the, the Scripture is teaching us. Paul goes on really to develop this further, and he uses the illustration of a child growing into maturity. So you can see why that one angle of using the word perfect in verse 10 deals with maturity as opposed to immaturity, the infant stage of the church to the mature stage of the church. And in its New Testament form, its infancy was not because it was sort of you know, reckless or stupid. It was, it was in an infant stage as children act as children do. But, but now there's the maturity, the passing away of those sign gifts the Lord putting the church on its own two feet. And Paul gives us an illustration. When we were as children or as a child, we would, we would think like children. That wasn't wrong to think like children. Children think like children. Just like adults think like adults. And now we're in a stage of maturity. We don't need these things. And Paul says, what belongs? What belongs to the maturity of the Christian church? Christian love. You're acting like children when you should be acting in maturity. And so when we want to seek to understand why charity is the greatest of all gifts, we can speak of its duration. It's the duration. And I believe it's a vital thing that we do that this evening. So let us in this life nurture what God says will endure. This love, this charity. The, the sign gifts, the supernatural, they don't. But charity does. Now, I know there's probably parts of the verse, questions you have. What about this? I don't know if I'm the right person to ask. <laughs> you can go home and do the study. You'll find a whole bunch of men disagree with each other. Um, but as I came to the meeting this evening, I, I asked the Lord, what does this mean? What is this main teaching here? And I'm convinced it's the beginning of verse 8. Charity never passes away. It doesn't vanish. Child of God, let us not live as if it has. We don't want to be like Corinth were. And why is it the greatest of, of all gifts? And it's our last thought this evening, and the second one as well. Because of its eternal role. Because of its eternal role. Uh, notice what verse 13 says. And, and, and now abideth faith and hope and charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. You know, the, the more we contemplate these words, the, the, the more searching they become. Paul seems to split up into categories certain things that will f fall away. They will fail. And, and it will happen, and it has happened. That's just a plain fact. But then he has a list of other things, and he says, they're, they're always going to be there, one of which is charity. But he names other, another two. And he says, okay, so what are the three things? He's already named three things that will uh, fade away, and, and you've got that in verse uh, 8. You've got prophecies, you've got uh, tongues, you've got knowledge. So he matches them up. He says three things have passed away. They're, they're no longer needed. That belongs to the, the early stage. But you've got another three things, and they're always going to be there. You've got uh, faith, you've got hope, and you've got charity. We want to conquer these things before we get to the, the, the climax of all this. And why, of all the three, charity is the greatest. By faith. Uh, by faith, you know, when, when all of these sign gifts had, had long gone, they must live by faith. And not by sight. And by faith, we refer to our belief and our trust in God regarding those things which we do not see, which our senses do not engage themselves in. We are not those who walk by sight, but by faith, the Bible says. A faith, remember, always remember this, that is not blind, it's not ignorant. It's not a 
jump into the dark. We don't, we don't hold to that type of thinking when it comes to, to faith. It's a faith that is rooted in the Word of God, and it's been tried, and it's been tested throughout time. It is, it is imperative that we live and we walk and we pray and we act by faith, and a faith which is founded on God's Word. You, you, you have to hold on to that, Christian. Satan will do everything to attack your faith, as we've been dealing with in the last number of Sundays, to, to undermine your faith and to cast aspersions and to make us doubt and to you know, lessen our faith. No, no, we, 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 we regard this as so precious. Because the Lord says here, these abide. Just, just remember now, I'm going to keep stressing this. Therefore, the others don't abide. That is the supernatural gifts. But faith does. Faith does. It abides. Hope abides. It stays there. And hope, this, this precious hope that Paul refers to here, is not hope so, but it's holy confidence. Holy confidence. Not hoping for the best. A, a blessed hope. There's that lovely verse, isn't there, in Colossians. You can tell me the verse after. I forget, is it Colossians 1? You know, Christ in you, the hope of glory. <laughs> the hope of glory. What a lovely banner to put over your life as a Christian. Christ in me, the hope of glory. And when we, when we think of um, a saint that has died and gone to be with Christ, and often the minister will say this, and Christians will say it to each other, rightly so, it's from Thessalonians, where we don't sorrow as others sorrow. And why, why do we as Christians not sorrow as others sorrow, because when the ungodly sorrow, they don't have any hope. They have no hope whatsoever. And it's a, it's a terrible thing to watch unsaved people grieve. But the, the child of God, though they grieve, and though they lament, and though they mourn, and rightly so, the passing of a loved one, it's tempered. It's tempered with hope. It's tempered with this blessed hope because we have a hope which is rooted in the word of God that them also will God bring again at the return of Christ. That's my hope that my Savior lives and when he comes, he brings them. They're raised. Raised to incorruption. That's, that's the reason why we have hope. Faith rooted in the person and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hope rooted in the blessed return of our great Savior and King. That's why those endure, because they are fixed to the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ forever. These abide faith, hope, love. And then he says at the end of his whole remarkable chapter, and if you had not these words before you in print, You'd find them hard to believe. But the greatest of these is charity. And the question we want to know is, why is this? Why is this greatest of all charity? And the reason why is because when it comes to faith, one day Christian faith turns to sight. Faith, even though it's to endure throughout all our time, when it comes to our glory, when the Lord calls you, brother and sister, and, you're, sa and you're, you're, you're saved, you're in Christ, and your time comes, or when our Savior calls for us and comes himself, faith, as the hymn writer says, right, so it returns to sight. We, we will no longer live by faith, but we'll live in sight of his blessed face. That's remarkable. And, and hope, hope dissipates, it goes away. And it turns into the full experience of the embrace of God in glory. But do you know what keeps on going past the threshold of time into eternity? Love. Do you know why? Because when we are in the presence of our great God, we will always go on loving him. And he will always go on loving us. Do you know why the salvation of a child of God is what we refer to as an eternal security? It sounds presumptuous to some, but it isn't. Because it's, it's rooted in the eternal love of God as displayed in Christ and the 
efficacy and the success of his work. The love that will not, cannot let me go brings me to him. And will God cease to love us in glory? No. Will we cease to love him in glory? No. It's perfected. It's matured. And they'll be in glory itself, in that new heaven, new earth, the perfect expression of love amongst each other. Amongst each other. And that's why Paul says it's the greatest of all these. Now, if that's the greatest, if that's the greatest, what true biblical charity and love is, according to the word of God, then I argue and I press it upon my heart and yours should it not be first and foremost in our church? To our God and his truth, to our great Savior, to the Holy Spirit, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to each other. And whether you have questions about this passage and everything has been made clear and plain to you this evening, I, I don't know, but I just hope those two anchor points stay with you. It never fails, and it's the greatest of all. And I, and I think if we hold on to that, we're not going to be as distracted as Alice was in the story. And um, we'll make sense of us. And may the love, just, love of God just work itself graciously within our hearts in these days. May he bless his word to our souls. Amen. Amen.